So smart. <laughs> That's so smart. People never think about that, right? Because people always get in panic mode. And when right. you let fear control your life, you make a lot of mistakes. Welcome to the Break Free Podcast with your host, David Mancella. In this podcast, we interview beautiful souls and amazing people that have achieved freedom in their life. Today we have with, with us Brian. How are you doing, Brian? I'm fine, thanks. Thanks for having me, David. Brother, uh, before we start the, the interview, just to give a background to the audience, uh, Tell me your full name, where are you from, and what do you do for a living? Yeah, so my name is Brian Stalkop. I live in Bend, Oregon, a beautiful mountain resort town in the center of Oregon. And uh, I own a financial planning and investment advisory practice. It's called Sherpa Wealth Strategies. Sherpa Wealth Strategies. Wonderful. Well, welcome to the show. Thank you. <laughs> Brian, um, I think your industry is one of the hardest industries to break through. Um, there is so much competition. A lot of people are trying to sell different packages to try to, you know, try to create, generate wealth for for their uh, for their clients. Tell me, what got you what got you into this business? Um, I got into this business. So this is a second career for me. First of all, so I was a journalist for 21 years. Uh, and I was always interested in money and, um, I, I had it in the back of my mind as a second career. So, um, and it's, I find that there's really not a lot of competition. There's a lot of people in the business, but there's not a lot of people who serve clients the way we do. Uh -huh. And so once you have kind of discovered your secret sauce, and um, then, honestly, your existing clients are happy to share that with That's you know, so their friends, that family, actually, and colleagues. It's fascinating that you had another life before this. So let's go back in time. Um, okay. Let's talk to the Brian in high school. It's the last year of high school. Okay. What was in your mind back then? Well, you wanted I, to go to college or you wanted to just to start working? No, I was a good student in high school. And... I was really um, focused on a career in photojournalism. So at that time, I mean, even as a sophomore in high school, I was working as a photographer for our local daily newspaper. And uh, by the time I was a senior in high school, I was working there almost full time. So uh, I was working a lot. <laughs> I was going to school and I was focused on uh, studying photojournalism at the University of Missouri. Uh, and so that's it was really my focus. I mean, uh, being a financial uh, advisor was the furthest thing from my mind. You know, it's amazing that you could actually find your passion in high school. Most people have no idea what they want to do in their life after they finish high school. It was um, I, a spark got lit when I was in junior high school. And, um, you know, I just kind of followed that path uh, almost single mindedly. Um, I could have gone down a lot of different paths, but I had one that I really enjoyed. And, you know, I was able to follow that for 21 years. Um, so it's pretty fun. That's incredible. So how long did it take you to, to get your degree in university for, for journalism? Well, I got, um, uh, I did my bachelor's and master's back to back in five years. So I did my bachelor's in three years. I just kind of motored through that. And then I did a, my bachelor's is in Latin American studies. Uh, a good liberal arts degree, and then I have a master's in journalism as well. So I did the whole thing in five years. That's amazing. Did you work while you were studying, or you just went full into academia? Uh, I did summer internships. I, uh, you know, did part-time jobs. You know, I was a janitor in the dorm, and you know, I, <laughs> I worked in a camera store, and I worked at, you know, Kmart. <laughs> you know, whatever jobs I needed to do to have spending money while I was in school. And then, you know, did summer internships at newspapers all the way through. Newspapers. So how do you get your first job as a journalist? Well, actually, this was going back to high school. <laughs> I There was a total lunar eclipse of the sun, and I took a photograph of it. And I went to the local newspaper and said, I've got this picture. 
I, what I didn't know is I was past their deadline. You know, it was an afternoon paper and uh, I had missed their deadline. Um, but the guy, uh, the managing editor, he kind of admired my hustle. And, um, and, and by the way, I didn't have a driver's license yet at that time. And so he said to me, he kind of, I think he was trying to blow me off. He's like, hey, kid, you know, I admire your hustle. Come back when you have a driver's license. So as soon as I turned 16, within that first week, I got a driver's license. And I went back and said, all right, I'm ready. You know, <laughs> wow. and they gave me a throwaway assignment you know, for something that it didn't matter if it never made it to the paper or not. And, uh, but I performed well and they kept giving me a few more. And then the next thing I knew I was working there quite a lot. And one of the things that was interesting about that is, you know, when you're shooting sports, I shot a lot of sports. So I'd go to a basketball game. I'd have to leave at halftime to get back in time to develop my film, print the pictures, you know, and give it to the sports editor um, and about that time, the games would be ending and the coaches would be calling in to the scores of their games. And these are wow. mostly high schools all around right. uh, southeastern Washington state. And so I volunteered. I just said, hey, I'm here. I can answer the phone. So I would answer the phones, take the sports scores. So I kind of learned a little bit about writing and the photography, you know, and, and I, I sort of became a fixture at that newspaper, <laughs> you know, and so that's why I had a full-time job, you know, while I was still a senior in high school, because I was, you know, I, I liked to work and I was fast and I was good. So Beautiful. it kept me busy. And after college, uh, what, what, what did you do? Like, did you, were you able to find employment right away or? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, um, uh, actually got offered a job before I finished school and turned it down because I hadn't finished my master's project yet. And I thought if I'd stepped off that campus, I would never finish the project. So right. I turned down the job. I went back and finished my master's project and the same newspaper came back to me a few months later and said, Hey, we'd love to hire you when you graduate. So my first job was at the commercial appeal in Memphis, Tennessee. And I was a page designer there. So I designed like the front page or the feature section, um, you know, on deadline. Um, uh, and then I went to work for the Indianapolis news as their photo editor, um, which is a really interesting experience because I'm still probably 24, 25 years old. And, and most of the staff were double my age. And so I, <laughs> so I, but I really had to learn because I, you know, was full of myself and thought I was the greatest thing since sliced bread. And so I really had to learn to be humble and how to work with people and meet them where they are and um, listen and not be a jerk, not be a young jerk, which I, you know, I could be. Um. <laughs> you know, it's, it's funny because uh, you just reminded me of a story. My first full time job as a software developer, as a programmer, most people were double my age. I was a 25 year old kid, 26 year old mm -hmm. kid. And, and I thought I was the best programmer in the world. And these people were just throwing me stuff that they didn't want to do. Like the right. boring stuff I will do, you know? Right. All the stuff I will do. And then I'm like, after I actually learned the job and stuff, I started being proactive. And I decided to learn another language that, that I thought it could help them. And before I knew, I was writing software for 2,000 teachers across the, across the city where I live. Um, uh, so I gained the respect. But it took me two years to gain the respect. Right. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And uh, I mean, and that's a, a funny thing, you know, in life, respect is really earned, yeah. you know, and you, you just have to earn it. And that's yeah. the same with my clients today. I mean, I met with a, a, a widow last week. A guy, one of my clients brought his mom in and she needed help with her money. And she said, how do I know I can trust you? And I said, you don't. And if I tell you that you can trust me, then you should get up and walk out. Mm -hmm. wow. <laughs> you know, because that's what a used car salesman would do is say, trust yeah. me. You know, yeah. I said, you will, I will earn your trust over time. And mm -hmm. opening an account with me is a little bit of a risk. You have to take that leap of faith, but I will earn your trust over time. And of course, her son, who had been a client for a long time, was sitting next to her. And he's like, Mom, I trust him. I trust him. It's okay. But, <laughs> but it's incredible. It's incredible that uh, 
that's why you are doing so well and that's why you're so well so well in a in an industry that is saturated right. but it's because the way you're doing business is completely different and that's why you're in this podcast by the way because i know yeah, you're, okay. you're an Thank amazing you. person <laughs> an amazing flow, right like imagine you you have actually to i have to earn your trust what a beautiful way to start a business uh, a, a, you know a business partnership right don't trust me I, I tell you i'm a good person but hey I'll lend your trust eventually, right? Right. It's, it's something that happens over time with experience. You know, do we keep our promises? Right. <laughs> you know, <laughs> do we keep your best interests in mind? And that has to be demonstrated over time. Exactly. Fabulous. Yeah. So how long did you last in that job uh, for that newspaper? Well, I, I worked for a total of four newspapers, you know, after college. So I was in Memphis, Indianapolis. I went to the Virginian pilot in Norfolk, Virginia. I was there for about five years uh, and did a variety of jobs uh, and um, eventually ended up being the senior editor at night for the newspaper. When they're putting the newspaper out, somebody's got to kind of be in charge of getting the thing out the door uh -huh. and making final news judgments on what's going to be on the front page, et cetera. So I did that job and then I went, I came back home to the Pacific Northwest uh, and I was the managing editor and then the editor of a newspaper in Bremerton, Washington. It was sort of a, the smallest newspaper I had worked at. It was a community daily, about 40,000 daily circulation across the Puget Sound from Seattle. Mm -hmm. And that was a great uh, run. And honestly, the uh, I thought and the company I worked for, I worked for a big newspaper chain, we all thought it would be a fabulous idea if I were to become a newspaper publisher. So the publisher is over the whole thing. You know, you've got advertising, circulation, marketing, production, and news. And so you're over the whole thing. So that's the path I thought I was headed down. They spent a couple of years giving me, getting me training in other disciplines that I didn't know because I came up in news, but I didn't know advertising or circulation or finance. And so I, I went to several trainings for that. They sent me to a business boot camp with Harvard Business School professors and really were preparing me. And this was in the late 90s, so 98, 99. The internet was just starting to come on. And um, I was sort of waking up to this, like uh, um, that this was a big threat to the newspaper industry. We were yeah. starting to see our advertising leak to the internet, you know automotive, uh, employment, real estate, that was all going to the internet. And I sort of looked up out of the newsroom and with my new business training, I realized that the business model was terribly broken and they really didn't know it yet. You know, and I was about to become the chief revenue officer of the Titanic. And, uh, <laughs> you know, and I, at this point, I'm in my late thirties, approaching 40 and, and I'm just thinking, this is, you know, the next 20 years are not going to be fun. Yeah. Um, and then the head of the newspaper division called me up. This is in uh, summer of 2000. And he said, hey, I don't really care how you do it. But by the end of the year, you need to have 20% fewer employees than you have right now. Wow. And so you figured out. And, uh, and luckily, I mean, I called a staff meeting. I said, this is what's going on. If any of you are thinking about looking for a job, let me help you. I'll provide a reference. I still had a great network in the industry. And we actually were able to downsize our staff by 20% without laying off a single person. And Good. I did get people placed in awesome jobs around, because there were still jobs in newspapers then. Right. So we got people placed in great jobs around the country. But at the end of that year, I was just emotionally exhausted. And I just thought, you know, I'm done. And mm -hmm. so uh, I started looking for a change. And um, how do you back. stumble? So how how do you stumble upon uh, financial advisory? Like what what did you do? So you resigned? Yeah. So well, what I did is uh, I had always been the guy at work who ran the investment club. You know, I was always interested. People would ask me, "What do you think about this or that?" Uh, there was a time in Virginia um, where I took a couple income tax courses just because my own situation had become more complicated with buying and selling a home, et cetera. 
And what I and so I started an income tax business. My first real entrepreneurial thing is, you know, I was working the night shift at the newspaper. So during the day, uh, I put an ad. I could get a free classified ad in the newspaper because I'm an employee. So I said, hey, I'll I'll do your taxes for you. And uh, I built it up over a couple of years to where I had 70 income tax clients. And so what I learned from that is that I liked talking to people about their money. I liked helping them with their money. I didn't particularly enjoy doing taxes mm -hmm. and I didn't see that as a career, but it did plant the seed that I could help people with their money. So, you know, fast forward another five years, I'm looking for a career change. And I just thought, you know, I think I could be a, a financial advisor, but I'm going to have to go get some training to do that. So I did quit my job. My wife and I both quit our jobs. We moved from Bremerton, Washington to Bend, Oregon. We made a decision that, that if I was going to start a business, let's pick the place we want to live first and then start the business. So smart. <laughs> That's so smart. People never think about that, right? Because people always... And this, this alone is, is fabulous for the audience, right? Like people always get in panic mode. And when right. you let fear control your life, you make a lot of mistakes. What you did is you took a step back, you quit your jobs, you knew that industry was dying. And you right, said, right. I'm going to take advantage of this situation to create a life, the life of my dreams. So do we really want to live here? Or do we actually start thinking about the best city that we can be in where we can start brand new. And that's, that's what we did. So we sold our homes. I mean, we didn't, we looked around the West, you know, we kind of took about a six month before I quit my job. We sort of explored and thought about it, but at some point we decided I quit my job. She quit her job. We sold our house. We moved to Bend. Um, now here's the secret. She had, she is a family nurse practitioner she was able to get a job more or less immediately and we bought the new home that we bought was one that we could afford on her salary because i took about an 80 percent pay cut <laughs> to, to go into a training program to be a financial advisor and so you know we had to um you know just live on assume we were going to live on her salary you just described my strategy for for starting my first well, the business that I run now, my, my, my first successful business, <laughs> mm -hmm. my wife. So I was I was in the corporate world making very, very good money, higher levels in big, big corporations. And uh, my wife went back to university. She got a computer science degree and it was all planned out. So I so, saw so that by the time she could actually get a professional job that will pay the mortgage and the bills, I could actually quit my Right. My job and start my business, because guess what? I went from a lot of money to zero income. Right. Zero. So as soon as my wife passed her probation and she was stable in a job and uh, and the, her job paid the mortgage and the food, it didn't pay everything. So right. I still had a big, a big burner in my back. Uh, but I thought this is my opportunity. This I'm going to seal this time. And then, you know what? I closed my eyes and I and I jumped in the unknown thinking. The worst it could happen is I have to go get another job. The worst it could happen is that I have to go get another job. And like for the first three, four years, I was when I was almost bankrupt, I was thinking, OK, maybe next month I have to go get another job. <laughs> well, look at me two, now, right? <laughs> and there's two things, David, about that story that resonate with me. Um, number one is the importance of having a good partner. Right. And so my wife and I, there were many years where I was, my career was taking off and she was going back to grad school to become a nurse practitioner, you know, and then, and just doing her uh, rotations and everything that she needed to do and, and get those first couple jobs under her belt as a nurse practitioner and get established. Um, but, you know, she was ready to dive into her career and so I was able to reset. So having a partner was really good. And the other thing is that income. So I did get into a training program with a national brokerage firm. It paid $24,000 a year plus commission, and uh, which wasn't much uh, <laughs> at that time. Uh, I mean, I started in 2001. I got my license a couple of weeks after 9-11. And 
for the first couple of years, all I did was lose people money, but because um, the markets were terrible then. But I, so I got this twenty four thousand a year, and then the commission stopped after twelve months. And my first paycheck, the first month after the commission stopped, was about five hundred bucks. The second one was one hundred and fifty six dollars, and I'm working seventy eight hours a week, and I bring home this check and show it to my wife. It's like, hey, honey. Oh my- 156 bucks what do you think you know and she said and she just looked at me and she said you know brian you told me there might be a few months like this just get back out there that's good and she she did and then honestly it's like the very next month things started to turn and then they took off but uh but it took a couple years of knowing that i wasn't going to make much money um and having a spouse that would help me you just decided to become a financial advisor in the middle of the dot com crash, one of the biggest. Yeah, exactly in the right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, the dot com bubble had already burst uh, right before I, you know, was making my decisions, and then, you know, yeah. I mean, I was home studying for my Series Seven licensing exam on nine eleven, and wow. I didn't get a lot of studying done that day, and I knew I had to take the test like in two weeks. <laughs> So it's like I'm buckling down, trying not to watch the news. You know, that's another lesson. It's an amazing lesson. You can never time your your strategy to get in. That's impossible. The best time to get in is right now. And the best time to get in would have been maybe 10 years ago. Right. But the next best time is right now. No, It doesn't matter what you want to do. If you're thinking that I'm going to wait for the right timing, you will get fear paralysis and you will never do it. Yeah. I think it's really important to take imperfect action. Yes. You know, just take action, Mm -hmm. understand it's going to be imperfect, adjust, you know, and, and, but keep moving forward. Um, And so, uh, and that's what we've done. And so we've built a pretty successful business. We're now passing 21 years in this business. Right, and um, really, uh, I mean, it's a great business. I would never trade the time I spent as a journalist. I did some incredibly fun things, met some mm-hmm. incredible people, uh, really love the culture of newsrooms and sort of the natural curiosity of what's happening in the world. So I love that. Terrible business. So I got out of the business. <laughs> and now in you know financial services, um, I really love the business. I just love helping people um, and uh, helping people reach their goals. And I've been doing it long enough now so that, you know, I set up that college fund for the two or three year old kid who has now graduated college. You know, How do you feel about that? That will be amazing. It's amazing. It's just the greatest thing ever. And you're just proud of every one of your clients who is able to stay on track and reach their own goals. And so, you find that your, you know, the relationships are the most important part. You know, the amateur psychology is the most important part. Managing the money is actually the easiest part of the job because um, I'm pretty simple. I, I, I keep it simple. But the, uh, you know, just working with people and keeping them on track to reach their goals, that's the most gratifying piece. It's funny that you talk about keeping it simple because I, I decided to start learning financial investing in 2017. I, I took a course on options trading and I went deep. I'm a computer programmer, so I like going deep in technology. So I started doing all these sophisticated investments and, you know, doing like almost like I didn't do daily trading, but I did weekly trading. Right. I lost a bunch of money and then I started to make some. But the more complicated I did my trading strategy, the more money I lost. Yep. So then I realized, no, the simpler I make it is the more manageable and the more money I'm going to to generate. And that's since then, that's been my philosophy is just keep it simple, stupid. Right. (laughs) And, you know, our best clients are financial delegators, so they don't want to do what you just did. Or maybe they've tried that in the past and realized they're not good at it or it's not their passion or they don't have time to be good at it. And so. Um, they really just delegate those decisions to us. And we are very long term. I mean, the most important ingredient in your investment portfolio is time. Yes. You know, long. and it, it's like baking a cake. You can put all the ingredients in there, but it's still got to bake or it's not a yeah. cake. And so, um, 
uh, yeah, I don't know. We we just keep a very simple approach. We don't have any exotic mm -hmm. strategies. Uh, and that, that's why there is that, that's why there is experts like you, right? Like, I I by by any means I never I will never recommend anybody to start doing trading or anything like that, because it's like you said, it's very time consuming, and if you don't have the if you have the fear of missing out, for example, of, of your emotions are a roller coaster, right. what you're going to do is lose all your portfolio. Right. It happened to me twice. <laughs> I mean, you know, I, I, I lost money on some dot com stocks back in, you know, 98, 99, because I thought I was pretty smart. And uh, it turned out I really didn't know what I was doing. Exactly. You know, and yeah. so. But, um, but if you look at the SP 500 and you look at the index, the SPX, for example, over time, it has the average return is eight percent compounded. Right. So, like, imagine so just let it do its thing. Years, right. <laughs> yeah, the biggest value that we bring to clients is really helping them stay invested and helping them stay focused on what they have, what's in their control. You know, are you adding money every month to your retirement account? Are you adding money to the kids' college savings plan? Um, did you get your will or your trust completed? You know, have you talked to this tax uh, accountant that we recommended to you? Uh, you know, do, do you have the proper home and auto insurance? What are all the things that are in your control? Because the market is not in your control. And guess what? It's not in my control either. Exactly. Do you have a will, for example, right? How many people yeah. die without a will and mm -hmm. they get into so much trouble for with inheritance, right? Yeah. Or, or or that they don't have their proper beneficiaries set up. Uh, uh, you know, their, their ex-wife is still the beneficiary of their retirement account at work, yes. you know? And so we're yeah. very systematic about checking every single one of those boxes. And the clients kind of think it's a little bit of a pain. You mean I have to go get it in writing that who my beneficiary is? And uh, yeah, you do, <laughs> because I want you to prove it to me. And s sometimes they call and the company does, oh, we don't, we actually can't find that. Can you fill out a new form for us? Well, what yeah. if they had died? <laughs> you know, so just helping clients check all those little boxes and make sure their whole financial house is in order is really, you know, that's the huge, the biggest value add. And then just help them stay invested when the markets get crazy. Yeah, it's a psychological game, too, because when the market crashes, people panic. And what you must be telling them is this is time to buy a little more. <laughs> right. Yeah. When tuna fish is on sale, you pick up a couple extra cans. Exactly. Right. But people do the opposite, right? They, when I started doing this, like I will, I will buy high and sell low because right. I was so panicked when this stock crashed. Right. No, I, yeah. And you know, my most successful clients are the ones who, when things are really terrible, will call me up and say, you know, I've got a little extra money under the mattress. Yes. <laughs> Let's yes. pick some good companies to buy or some good funds or rebalance yeah. the portfolio. So, uh, yeah, that's kind of the secret to long-term success. Now, most of people that listen to this podcast will, will love to start their own business or they're just starting. Mm -hmm. And one of the biggest obstacles, as you may know, is how do you find and convert your clients? So when you started this this venture, how, how did you go about to get new clients? Yeah, so it's really interesting. So I started with a national firm in the United States. It's Edward Jones. And so Edward Jones, you know, their whole, their target new advisor is a mid-career person who's kind of tired of the corporate treadmill and wants to get on their own. So that's, so I fit that perfectly. I was like late 30s, closing in on 40 had kind of hit a little bit of a ceiling and was ready to make a change. So they put us through a training program to get our securities license. But the other thing they did is they trained us to literally knock on doors. So I went knocking on doors. I knocked on over. Like, yeah, door, door to door, door to door. And so I went, uh, I knocked on over 2000 doors and I knocked at every one of those doors at least twice. And so I knock on the door, I, you know, introduce myself, uh, just, I'm going to open an office here in the neighborhood, just chat them up a little bit and see kind of what their issues are. You know, how do you feel about your investments or what are you doing to save for retirement or, 
you know, if you see some toys in the front yard, have you started a college savings plan for those little rugrats or whatever, but you just wanted to start a financial conversation. And so my goal was to have 25 of those conversations a day at the doorstep. Um, and then, uh, and it wasn't counted as one of my 25 unless I got their name, their phone number and permission to call them back. Absolutely. So I might have to knock on 80 doors to talk to 40 people to get 25 people to give me their name. And then I would send them a handwritten thank you note. And then I would then call like two weeks later. I noticed that you were interested in saving for retirement. Have you started your retirement account? You know, it, I would offer them an investment, um, but mostly it was just to start a financial conversation. And then I would go back and knock on their door again a couple of weeks later. And then I would call them a couple of weeks after that. And so follow up. it's just follow up. So it usually took, uh, you know, five to 10 contacts before somebody would either open an account with me or they'd put me off, call me in six months, uh, or they would just say, you know, go away, leave me alone. Um, and so you just had to have a certain number of those people on the hopper all the time. But that grew within, I don't know, three, four years. It was uh, over 500 households that I had opened accounts with. 500. Um, and which is crazy, by the way, I totally do not recommend that in your sure. financial services. So by 2008, you know, we had the crash in 2008. I've got over 500 households and you cannot possibly be in touch with 500 households uh, when the markets are crashing. Right. And so, <laughs> so that was a really important lesson, but I, it was a commission based at that point. You know, I, in order to get paid, I needed to open new accounts and attract new dollars. So that's how you end up with 500 households. Um, and I learned that that was kind of a stupid way to build a business and so over the next couple of years i trimmed that down to a couple hundred um, by essentially giving those accounts to newer advisors who are just getting started i gave my smaller accounts away yeah, uh, yeah. and so uh, and then after about 10 years at jones i went out on my own and started my own independent financial planning and investment advisory firm because i could really do things the way i wanted to and I was really transitioning away from a commission sales, uh, which was their model, to a fee for assets under management and fees for financial planning Beauty. model, which is the model I'm in now. So, so that was it's another more, risk. It's more fair too, right? Because not only to you, but also to the client, because they know how much they're paying for you to manage their assets. Mm -hmm. And they know that you don't have control over the market but you know how the market moves. So you can advise on that. And this is beautiful. You do it but, completely different, eh? But the, <laughs> and we're on the same side of the table because if their account value goes down, my income goes down. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, it, you, you, so it puts us, you know, we both have an interest in seeing that account value go up. So their account goes up and my income goes up. So like, because a lot of folks, you know, like, they do it all commission based and they, it doesn't matter. The management fee is always there and you don't even know what, what, what they're getting paid. And all you know that your portfolio is shrinking and they are not being affected. Right. What you're doing is, oh my God, like you're putting your hands on the fire for your clients. Right. Right. So anyway, so that was, um, you know, that big first risk was leaving journalism and becoming an advisor. But, you know, I was working for a big company, a stable company. And then the next was going out on my own. Mm -hmm. you know, leaving the mothership and kind of having my own firm. And so that was a little scary too, but um, honestly, it's probably the best thing I ever did. So from the time that you started your first job mm -hmm. until the time that you were completely independent in your own business, how long did it take? You mean starting my first job in high school? No, in, in uh, un after university. Oh, well, let's see. Uh, it, I think I worked after university for 13, 14 years in, you know, in, cause I was working all the way through college, you know, I mean, I started when I was 16 working for newspapers. So, but after I graduated, it was 13 or 14 years in the corporate world, 
you know, and then uh, I kind of got tired of that, made the career change and switched over. So um, it, that was another thing. So not only was the newspaper industry going bad, but I always felt like there was somebody else in control of my next promotion and my yes. next raise. Yes. So, you know, there was that guy who was the head of the newspaper division who was a nice guy, but he had, you know, like 25 newspaper editors who were all jockeying for the next rung up the ladder. And there was a lot of politics and uh, a lot of good old boy network. How about the fact that you only have one source of income? Have you thought about that? Yeah. One yeah. source of income, <laughs> only one. <laughs> right, and somebody else was kind of in control of that. And, and even my annual bonus, you know, I could hit all my targets, but you know, if the advertising director didn't sell enough, you know, department store ads, I could lose my bonus because they, we didn't hit our revenue numbers. So I really wanted to take more control of my own income. And, you know, I've had some years that were really good and I've had some years that were not as good, but usually I just had to look in the mirror if I wanted to figure out what was going on. You know, I, I couldn't really pass it off on somebody else. <laughs> yeah, that's taking full responsibility for your own life. And that's why you're right. successful, right? Tell me, how did you overcome or overcame the fear of, of rejection when you started knocking on doors? You know, this is where the journalism really helped. <laughs> Because if you've been to uh, stressful situations with people, you know, usually if a newspaper photographer shows up, it's usually either somebody's best day in their life or maybe their worst day in their life. And so I've had a chance to be there when people were kind of stressed out. And I just, people would say things and it would just roll off my back. And then when I became the editor of a newspaper, you know, people would write letters to the editor. Well, guess what? If you're the editor, <laughs> that letter is to you. And <laughs> sometimes those letters were very personal and very, um, you know, insulting. <laughs> wow. So I just developed a thick skin, you know, and so it, nothing really fazed me. So when you go knock on somebody's door and somebody's rude to you, just like go to the next door. You know, I mean, I don't take it personally. Maybe they had a bad day. Yeah. You know, maybe they're sick. Uh, you know, maybe their spouse, they had a fight before I showed up. Maybe their kids are being obnoxious. It has yeah. nothing to do with me. Yeah. You know, <laughs> and, and, you know it's, and it's a beautiful analogy. By the way, that's how I ended the road rage. I used to get so mad when people called me off on the road. And then I started thinking, what about their life? I have no idea why they are behaving that way. Why would I get mad if I don't know the whole story? Right. right? And you yeah, see, so you just have... in the highways now, and it's like, guys, like, come on, like, you don't even know what's going on in their life. Yeah. It's not personal. It's, it's <laughs> like, you know, this Stephen Covey tells a story in The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. If you listen to the audio book, which I did many, many, many years ago, but he tells a story of being on a subway in New York early in the morning, and there's a man who's sitting there on the subway, and there, he's got a couple of kids that are just running wild. And the guy is not doing anything about it, the dad. And the kids are running wild. And, the, and, and Stephen Covey's like, what is wrong with this guy? Why doesn't he get control of his kids? And he, so he goes to kind of talk with the guy and just starts to engage him in a conversation. Well, it turns out they're coming home from the hospital. The guy's wife has just died. Yeah. So keeping control of the kids on the subway car was really the the last thing on his mind. On his mind. And how could you have known that, right? That's and, called empathy, right? You have to have empathy. You don't know what's going on. So you just can't judge. So so what if I knock on somebody's door and they're mad at me, then, you know, whatever. I mean, I did have one person sick their dog on me, and that kind of made me mad. But uh, I just didn't go back to that door again. <laughs> and, you know, and yeah, some people might be rude, but, I, you know, this is a beautiful, again, this is a beautiful, wonderful lesson for the ones that are willing to listen the only way to be prosperous in your own business is if you create clients and have honesty with those new clients and to create clients you have to knock on doors it's the only way you it has to it could be a digital door but you have to knock on that door and you have to be willing to let it slide when you feel rejection because you don't know where the rejection is coming from don't take it personal if right, those right. things are not there for any entrepreneur, they will never be successful, ever. 
No, you just have to keep going and know that. And the other thing is really understanding over time, you kind of understand who your best clients are. So mm -hmm. at first, my best clients were the ones who could fog a mirror or who could write a check. You know, they would open an account with me. So you're my best client. But, uh, you know, over time, I realized that I really wanted to work with people who had certain problems to solve that I could help them with, who were willing to let me help them and who are actually pleasant people to work with. Yeah. So uh, I took some clients early on who, because I needed the money and they had money to invest with me, um, but some of them were just nightmare clients. Yeah. And, and so, um, you know, I figured that out pretty quickly and now I can kind of sniff that out, you know, when I have that first meeting with people, if somebody's gonna be a pain in the neck, then, you know, just see you later. move on. Yeah. See you later. Have Very a nice much. life. I wish you the best. Yes. And um and, and and just move on because you know our business is not transactional. I started out kind of transactional, commission based, but I, you know I'm having 20 year relationships with these clients. Yeah. You it's know? your life basically. It's your and, life. It's the people you're choosing to spend your life with. Right. And so I do not want to be stuck with somebody who is a jerk. Yeah. You know, I, I want to work with people who I enjoy working with and who enjoy working with me and they value what I do. And, and, you know, I appreciate their struggles in life and we kind of go through it together. And that's one of the most important secrets of creating the life on your own terms, to have a fulfilled life. You have to surround yourself with people that you love and you like. Right. And I know at the beginning, the sacrifices is there. I did it too, right? I took anything, anybody that would want to write a piece of software with me, I will do it because I, I needed to eat. I needed, needed to cash flow, right? Right. You need cash flow. But eventually, once you become good enough and your, and your word of mouth is out there, you deserve to yourself to choose, choose your clients properly, right? Right. Because otherwise, your days are going to be horrible. I remember I got so bad in my business letting everybody in, that one day I woke up and I did not want to go to the office. And I remember my, my corporate jobs because some of them, that happened, right? When you wake up, I'm like, oh, I have to go back to the office. And then I look at myself in the mirror and I said, what am I doing wrong? I created this business to have a beautiful life and I'm regretting going to the office. And then right, I, right. I did the inventory and it's because half my clients were not so good clients. <laughs> you know, the great thing about being an entrepreneur is, you know, the four freedoms that Dan Sullivan talks about, that time, money, relationship, and purpose, those are the four freedoms. But, you know, relationship is one of the freedoms. So if you own the company, you get to pick. But like, I don't have to do business with this person. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, and the good thing is that when you do the business with the people that you enjoy, um, then they tell other people who are like them about you, you know, and, uh, you know, it's kind of a self-fulfilling thing. Incredible. Brother, thank you so much for your time. I want to be conscious of it. I know you're a very busy person and, and a very blessed person for sure. One last question before we go. Mm -hmm. If you had access to the busiest highway on earth and there was a billboard right on top that everybody could see, what were you writing it? Huh, that's a really great question. I would say my, I, on that billboard, I would say, follow your dream. So it wouldn't be about my business. It would be about the person driving down the highway. Yeah. You know, follow your dream, uh, whatever that is. Mm. You did that, right? You yeah. discovered yourself. Uh, you found a new passion. You realized that the industry you were in was a failing industry. And look at you now, it got you to be successful. And, and it took you more than 20 years to get there, by the way. Right. right. Yeah, it's a journey. It's a journey. It's a journey. It's a journey. And you have to enjoy the journey too, right? Yeah, no, it's been great. Okay. Now, I really appreciate the opportunity, David. Uh, it's been a lot of fun. Brother, thank you so much. Have a wonderful rest of the week. Uh, if people would like to find your advisory services and your, your wealth management services, where, where can they find you online? Uh, it's SherpaWealthStrategies.com. Sherpa, like the mountain climber. SherpaWealthStrategies.com. And uh, yeah, they can find us online and uh, chat us up. Beautiful.
Brother, thank you so much. Have a wonderful rest of the day. That's all for today's episode of the Break Free Podcast. Head on over to iTunes and subscribe to the show. Starting your own business can be tough, but it doesn't have to be. Visit davidmansilla.com to pick up a copy of the number one international best-selling book, Breaking Out of Corporate Jail. Expand what you consider to be possible and reach your full potential. And join us on the next episode.